what led to this message this morning was me asking myself, have I ever noticed what my life or life itself would be like without color? Because there are people who can't see color. There are people who are blind, obviously. But there are people who can't see color, too. What would my life be with, without color? And, of course, that facilitates m my imagination, which is, which is vast. Uh, and, uh, and, but you know what? i got to stop because I'm being reminded. I'm being smacked here with a brick. I'm um, seeing the color red because today's my 33rd anniversary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just it just hit me. Oh, I didn't forget. I got a card, so I'm okay. You know, I didn't forget, but uh, yeah, two cards because you know you get one. It's like, well, yeah, that says that, but you got to get the other one because it's even better, and you know how that goes. And they cost like seven dollars, man. Come on, what's up with that? For a card, you know. So I just did a crayon thing and folded it in half. And <laughs> I love you. So anyway, happy anniversary. But color, color goes with that in my mind too. Color goes with everything. Uh, the beauty of, uh, of flowers, you know, when you look at flowers and the, the, just the vast beauty of just this plant that God created, it's never just one color. It looks like it is from a distance. And you go up and it's all this magnificent color blended in to make one a color revealed to your senses uh, or, the, or a sunset. Which I know Sherry and Jason a lot of times post sunsets uh, from the river. It's like, wow, look at that. The color is just amazing. And, and we're surrounded by it all. Uh, the God, God's carpet of green, we see. You know, we're so strange about that. But, you know, we have this carpet we want to cut. We water it to make it grow, and then we want to cut it after it grows. It's like, why are we doing that? You know, but the, the carpet of green that we see, green here, re, 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 there's a purpose for every color that we use. You know, green s signifies peace and, and calm and, and God's green carpet just in our yards alone. Have you ever just look at that? Or you just think, well, i got to cut the grass, you know? Uh, uh, snowflakes, you know, up close. <laughs> All these things, waterfalls that you see we, uh, at different places, uh, the sea, which we just got back from the Atlantic, the sea just lapping the, uh, the shore and the sounds and the smells, but mostly the visual, the sky and where the sea meet. All these colors that are just all around us are just without exaggeration amazing, but they all uh, mean something. And all of these compositions of God's glorious creations would lose, I think, a lot of their appeal, uh, appeal if we didn't see the color in them. And so that's what, uh, that's what led to the message here today. I don't, uh, and as I looked at my notes, I, I think I finally see where the Holy Spirit is going. And that's very important to put yourself in a position in your life to allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. And most of the time that requires for us not to think. Don't think about it. Don't, we just mess it up when we start trying to think about this is how God should do something. Uh, presenting messages, uh, witnessing to your friends or your coworkers. When we start to analyze and think, this is what I'm going to say, this is what I'm going to do, and you get in that position, and that's not what you did, that's not what you said, because it never happens that way. And then after the fact, you think, well, I wish I would have said, I wish I would have done. But you realize if you just go in blank, what's God do? He promises he'll give you what to say. He promises that in every situation in your life. Just don't overthink it. Go in blank and let the Holy Spirit. I know that sounds crazy, but we're supposed to be peculiar according to Scripture. So uh, that's how it is with messages too. Stuff happens, so you just go with it. And then you reflect upon even, even things as back as, uh, as early as your childhood, how God impresses color on your mind throughout your child, even in your memories, uh, and these windows of miracles. And all of this is not without purpose. It all has a purpose. God has designed it so that if we would and if we should, we might have color for a foundation to grow more in him. And it's throughout the Scripture. There's so many, there's reason for the colors in the spectrum of the rainbow. Obviously, we know where that comes from. Uh, you know, there's reason for the colors of the curtains in the tabernacle, for the panorama of, uh, of uh, Ezekiah, or Ezekiel's temple, for uh, the pillars of New Jerusalem and the colors there, the colors in the wall that we read about, the 12 stones and the 12 colors, uh, the biblical examples go on and on. You could 
Gosh, you could study colors in the Bible for the rest of your life, really. There's so many examples. When God appeared to Noah after the flood and placed the rainbow in the sky, he did much more than just show Noah a phenomena. I mean, obviously, he was revealing a covenant, but also, too, in the seven colors, beginning with red and ending with purple in the rainbow, God was displaying a miracle that demonstrates the complete redemption of the human race. Our kids have learned about this in VBA and also in their classes. Uh, if you don't know about that, ask kids. Ask, I think uh, Josh or, or Casey, they'll have that information, but it's neat to see how all those colors deal with redemption uh, and how our young people know about. So let's briefly look at color then, and first let's look at it in the natural sense because it helps us understand, I think, how God's laid things out. Uh, it's always neat when you compare things uh, with the trinity uh, that we deal with. There's also a trinity in natural color. There's only three primary colors. Red, yellow, and blue. That's it. The, the, there's only three, just like the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, blue, uh, red, and yellow, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's only three primary colors on this planet, and they come from the earth in some form or another. Now, we've tried to manufacture uh, synthetics and this, but none of them work as well as the natural colors that come from the earth. Uh, and you, you can make any color... Uh, by combining these colors, but you cannot make these colors. You cannot make yellow. You cannot make uh, blue. They, they just exist. But with these three colors, and then when you throw in the absence of all other colors and the presence of all other colors, as in black and white, when you throw that in, you can make any color that exists. Just billions. I don't know if there's a a number, but with the, with the uh, with com combining these colors, you can make any shade in the spectrum that we, that we know can be obtained. Knowing this then brings us some thought provoking and very valuable scriptural principles. In the our, one of our primary colors, red, uh, we have a Hebrew word O U D E M, which means red clay, and that's where that comes from. It's the root word where we get Adam, we get Eve, red clay. Oh, man, from dust, from dirt, from clay. Uh, 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 Edom, Esau, all of which speak of the flesh. So at the very onset, then you have a color that, that exists by itself that cannot be created, that cannot be controlled by humans. Neither can the flesh. And it represents that. This is an exact counterpart of the first primary color. The second primary color is yellow. And you can find yellow in... in Wow, many principles of the Word of God. But yellow seems to always speak of trial and purging. Not because we react as cowards, but because that's just what it is. 1 Peter 1.7 is a great example. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, yellow, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fire is almost always used in the purification process, especially in biblical descriptions, and fire is associated with the color yellow. So even though, and we know we cannot make yellow, we also cannot manufacture control over our tests, our trials, our tribulations. We cannot control the fire. Oh, we try, don't we? We try with everything that we have, but we can't. Just recent examples prove that. We have no. We think we have. We have no control. We have, we really don't. We have control on how we respond most most of the time. But but let's look at the third primary color because that's what we're really going to deal with uh, more than the other show this morning. When we come to this color in scripture, we approach. I think one of the most sublime uh, and unparalleled subjects of the Bible. And there's so much listed about it. I can only uh, briefly touch on it. But Esther eight fifteen, Ezekiel twenty three six. Blue is the dress of royalty. Uh, throughout history and throughout Scripture, according to Ezekiel 27, 7 and 24, uh, it had to be imported in. They didn't have it in the region, so they had to import in anything that was not only the, made of the color blue, but anything to do with the dye or the inks that they might try to use. It had to be brought in because it was not a natural resource. Exodus 28, Exodus 39, the priests were required to wear this color blue as it pertains to very specific pieces of clothing. 
Blue is the color of the heavens above. We know this. We see it all the time. And it speaks to us of the eternal presence of Jesus the Christ. Uh, it's the color of revelation. The, I call it the Jehovah color, uh, the representation of the revealed God. Blue, uh, Exodus 24, 10. And they saw the God of Israel, that is a convincing manifestation of his presence, and under his feet it was like pavement of bright sapphire stone, like the very heavens in clearness. Sapphire is a transparent stone that's bright blue in color. And what a, what a great thought. This gives us a very good visual. It's the color of God's chosen nation. I don't know if you've noticed that. Star of David, the, the flag itself, blue. The people of Israel dating all the way back to the time of David, the color is blue. Exodus 25.4, 26.4, 28 It was the primary color in the tabernacle. There's all kinds of colors, but blue was the primary color in the tabernacle. Even God's throne is is spoken of as blue, as sapphire, uh, Ezekiel 126. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone, a blue stone, and seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man. Ezekiel 10, 1. Then I looked and behold, in the firmament that was over the heads of the cherubim, there appeared above them something looking like a sapphire stone, blue, in form resembling a throne. This wonderful color, and this is... Believe me, we're going somewhere with this, but this is good information for you to have. We're going somewhere. This wonderful color indicates the divine majesty, and it indicates that that divine majesty has come to us in unprecedented grace. I hope when I'm done here this morning, when the Holy Spirit's done, you never see blue the same way again. And when you do look at blue, you think of something totally different than just color. And you see what it actually represents and what it means. Blue is ultimately the symbol of the word of God and the healing power of God. That's what blue, the color blue represents, among other things. But all these representations, all these conveyances that we read throughout Scripture concerning a blue culminates in this declaration in Numbers 15, verses 37 through 40. It's written there. The Lord also spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and they shall put on the tassel of each corner a cord of blue. It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes uh, after which you played the harlot so that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. Fringe on all the men of Israel, uh, if they could afford it, I suppose. But the fringe itself represented the law because it encircled the wearer and restricted him uh, within it. Uh, the blue color, especially of the cord, reminded the wearer of the sky above and the origin of the commandments they were to obey of the law. We, you could not go anywhere as a wearer of this blue. You could not go anywhere without seeing the heavens. And God's dwelling place stretched out above the vastness of it and be reminded of that. So the clothes were encompassed in blue uh, with the divine laws of God. And the only hope was to remember, to be reminded every time you look down, you see blue and you're reminded to meditate on the laws of God every second of every day. Every time you look at that, you're reminded blue, God, the law. So the color blue represents the divine or the heavenly while being the symbol of the word and also the healing power of God himself. Now, knowing all this, now with all this information, let's take a look at a very familiar scripture and it'll give us a whole new insight into how God uses things and does things and gives us a better understanding of circumstances in scripture. Hopefully a new appreciation, a new understanding. Mark 3.10, let's find the significance. For he had healed so many that all who had distressing bodily diseases kept falling upon him and pressing upon him in order that they might touch him. Luke 6, 19. And all the multitude were seeking to touch him. For healing power was all the while going forth from him and curing them all, saving them from severe illnesses and calamities or calamities. Touching 
Jesus. This is today, this is what blue is about. Touching Jesus. This is what the color blue is all about. And I, I just repeat it again because it's so important. Touching Jesus. We spend, a, and I have, I still do, in my prayers for people, spend a great deal of time crying out to God to meet our various needs in this life by asking him to touch us. A lot of time in prayer for that. Think about it. That's what we do. God, manifest your presence. Come to us. Be with them. Touch them. And on and on our prayers go. We spend a lot of time doing that. This is certainly acceptable. However, this morning, I, I have to tell you, that, and I'm experiencing it more and more in, in certain crisis situations. And believe me, uh, Lisa will attest, I get sent into a crisis every day, uh, sometimes three crises. I don't know what the plural is of that, but that's okay. Uh, so it becomes very important to understand there's something, uh, the words escape me, but there's something wonderful. There is something uh, magnificent, superb. There is something otherworldly about us touching him. And I know we spend a lot of time asking him to touch us, but us touching him. There comes a moment in your life where that's what you have to do. You have to touch him. I'm not talking about works, being saved by works and making efforts. We've already established your position in that through messages, especially desire, I suppose. And Well, even last week talking about our new, uh, new covenant. So I'm not talking about your position as a child of God. I'm talking about intimacy and growing and becoming closer to him. Sometimes you just got to touch him. And it makes such a huge difference in your life. Touching Jesus requires that we draw near to him. That we, uh, well, Scripture puts, abide in me, I'll abide in you. We have to make the effort to draw near to him. It demands that we strive to get closer. It demands that we make an all-out effort to get close to Jesus. It demands that we touch him. Just one touch is all it takes. He's God in the flesh. Just one touch is all it takes. But we have to do it for healing, for deliverance, for victory, for everything in our lives, for anything in our lives to experience change. Touching Jesus is all that matters. It's all that matters. And we get lost in everything else, don't we? We do. We get lost in everything else but what matters. And that is touching Jesus. Jesus. So where does the color blue enter into significance then? Mark 6, 56. And whenever he came, or wherever he came into villages or cities or the country, they would lay the sick in the marketplaces and beg him that they might touch even the fringe of his outer garment. And as many as touched him were restored to health. We just told you about the fringe and what it was and what it looked like and why God had him put it there. And they touched the fringe of his outer garment. Matthew 14, 35 and 36. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around into all the surrounding country and brought to him all who were sick and begged him to let them merely touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were perfectly restored. The fringe, the, the tassel, the hem, the, the blue cord that God had them put uh, uh, on the bottom of their clothing. This was a part of the men's clothing in Israel. This is what they wore. And it was the definitive symbol of the word of God and the healing power of God. That's why they touched it. That's why they went for it. That's why they were almost obsessed with getting to it. This mode of dress was so common in the day of Jesus, even Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for altering uh, this dress. What do they do as we do today? Mark, uh, Matthew 23, 5, they made their fringes excessively long just to show how much of the word of God and the power of God they had in their lives. That's what they did. What well, is written there. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men for they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen the tassels of their garments just to impress everybody. Ooh, I'll make mine extra long. Man, no, I go to, man, I go to synagogue every day. 
I'm righteous, I'm holy. That's what they, they exaggerated everything. So we know Jesus came to fulfill the law. He even told us that he did that, and we know that he did that. So this had to be what he was wearing. This was from God. This is part of the dress that God told them to wear. This hem, this fringe, this tassel, and the blue cord is the area on Jesus where people, the Jewish people were reaching and touching in order to be healed. Why? Because that was their culture. That's what they were taught. That was the law passed down. This blue cord, this tassel, is what people were going after. Mark 5, 25 through 34 and Matthew 9, 20. We all know this story, but let's experience it for the first time. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and took Touch the fringe of his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. And, of course, immediately Jesus perceived uh, in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd, and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go, and, go in peace and be healed of your affliction. We have to get to the point, and, and I know we wait for crisis. We wait for everything to come. We wait for it to be at its heaviest point, but we should practice this every day. We have to recognize that we have a great, great need in our lives, no matter what it is, and there is nobody else that can meet it but Jesus. We have to live that way daily, not just when crisis comes, not just when, when trouble happens or the fire starts burning so hot you can't hardly stamp it, uh, stand it. We have to be desperate for him every single day. We have to be purpose-driven and determined to reach out to Jesus. Desperation is the key. It really is the key. No matter what, no matter how long it takes, no matter who, no matter what is in your way every day, you must not stop until you reach Jesus, until you get to him, until you can in your mind's eye see the blue cord on the fringe of his garment. You cannot stop until you touch him. Every day, every day. How many problems could be solved? How, how, many pro how many families could be saved? How many financial, emotional, physical, uh, spiritual disasters could be averted if we would only press in? It's never easy. Oh, access is never easy. I mean, just like this lady, that's why this story is shared. It's a, a great example. I mean, she's in a, a place in time where uh, you're not allowed to touch a man, especially a woman of, uh, of her position. You're not allowed to, especially a rabbi. I mean, she could have been stoned for what she did. But it's never easy. you got to press through the crowd. you got to sometimes elbow and push your way past. you got to make your mind up. It doesn't matter what my family says. It doesn't matter what my f supposed friends say, my co workers I'm going to reach out and I'm going to touch Jesus every day of my life. Now, and I, I'm passionate about this. Why? Because I see people who've not done that and they're getting ready to go meet him. They're getting ready to go meet him. And then I leave and I, other people come up to me with all this stuff that's like so second grade. Well, they looked at me with their eyes crossed and I'm not going back to church anymore because they just didn't, you know, they just, they spit on me when they talked. What? Or whatever, I think you should get my point. The, the, there's a moment in your life you have to realize that nothing else matters but touching Jesus. Nothing else matters. And if you do that, everything else is taken care of. Legitimately taken care of. What this this lady that you know that went through the crowd and, and was healed is such a disturbing example to those of us who have 
lives of such ease. And we really do. We, think about your life. Now, I know we have trouble. Now, I know there's things that happen. We get upset. I do. You know, but, but when you think about the big picture, we have, we have lives of such ease and we refuse to touch Jesus because it's just too much trouble. I got, oh man, I got to go past that person. I got to do this. I got to do that. We're healthy in our bodies. God has blessed us so greatly and we refuse to, to press in and touch Jesus. We let such small things stop us from pressing in. Such small things. There's other words, but well, well, we'll even get a little discouraged with ourselves or, or troubled and, and uh, uh, anxiety kicks in. The first thing we want to do is give up and go hide somewhere. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we get some opposition and then we give up and we don't struggle at all. We just give up. We stop. Well, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I get it. I've got a few battle scars in this spiritual warfare, so now I think it's time for me to just turn tail and run and go over here and live, live life what I think is easy. And I'll have to face that. I don't want to get through that crowd, and I especially don't want to get on my knees. I just bought these pants. You know, man. I know they're on sale at Kohl's, but still. Hmm. But really, just, just here to let you know and remind myself, most importantly, all you have to do in life, uh, fundamentals, all you have to do is touch him. That's all you have to do. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, there's opposition. There's, there's going to be problems getting there. But if you'll get to him, just one touch. That's what blue's all about. Next time you're looking at the blue sky and, and all its splendor, it's about touching Jesus. It's about touching him. And next time the cloud covers over that blue and you think that, that there's no way you're ever going to get to him, just keep looking up because eventually there's going to be a little peak of blue just come out and then it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And let the blue remind you, I need to touch Jesus and I'm going to do whatever it takes for that to happen in my life. All you have to do is get closer. Fight your way to get to him and touch the fringe of his garment, the blue cord. Touch Jesus. And if you, if you will do this, if you will spend time developing this discipline, this habit of touching Jesus no matter what, then once you, and without exaggeration, once you make contact, you will never stop pursuing it ever again. This is what makes a difference when you enter a room. And I know this because I see it. Uh, when you enter a room and the presence of God comes with you, you're not asking him to manifest anywhere. You have touched him and he stays with you. You've connected and he stays with you and you enter a room and even the atmosphere of the room changes, not because of you, but because of the presence that comes in with you. It's the Holy Spirit when you touch him. The blue in the heavens tells us the story. Uh, and it, tell, it speaks to us of the eternal presence of Jesus Christ, the color revelation, the Jehovah color, the color of the word of God and the healing power of God. And it should remind us every time we look at the sky or anything blue, a blue shirt as far as that goes, anything blue, it should remind us that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the power of God. And touching him is all that matters in my life. Not about superstition, not about inanimate objects having any power other than representation. So, you know, don't, don't go there. And Pastor Jerry said blue's magic, so I need to just get everything blue in my life. No, no. It's a representation. I have a, just so you know, I have a cross on my uh, little metal cross that pins to my, uh, what's the thing to flip down in the car? Visor, thank you very much. See how old you get and you forget these things? There's so many words going through my head, and none of them were visor. So... <laughs> Uh, and so uh, it's a reminder. There's nothing magical about it. There's no power in this inanimate object. But it, when I, every time I look up, it reminds me, oh, Lord, I need you. I need, I'm going into a, a crisis situation, whatever it might be. I need you because I can't do this on my own. And that's what it does. Same way with the colors. Look at them and let them remind you, I need to touch Jesus today. 
every day. Trigger focus and trigger trigger faith. It's all about faith. The reason the Jew oh, and I want to I don't want to close without mentioning this. The reason the Jews reached for the hem of Jesus' garment is because of Jewish thinking of the day. And out of Malachi four and two, the Jews rightly understood references to Messiah because they were taught this from the moment they were old enough to understand. This is what's written there. But unto you who revere and worshipfully fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. In Jewish expression at the time of Jesus, the tassels on the garments of these men of Israel were called wings. That's what they called them. Have you got your wings on today? Did you make your wings? Are your wings the right color? That's what they called this tassel, which included that cord of blue. Wings. So they naturally acted according to what they knew. This is the idioms that they were familiar with. These people were touching the wings of the Messiah, and they were being healed immediately. Healing in his wings. And my personal opinion is the reason it's down here, the reason that God even brought that up to put it down low is because it is at the feet of Jesus where healing is found, my opinion. I know we like, God says we're his friends, we're his associates, we're, we're joint heirs. But I can tell you it is humility. It is at the feet of God where, where true healing is found. When you humble yourself and get on your knees. To touch Jesus, the first step is humility. Now, you may not be able to get on your knees physically, but spiritually, you need to get on your knees. You need to bow before the King of Kings and accept the invitation of the Holy Spirit to move in his direction in order to experience greater intimacy with your Creator than you've ever experienced before. His name is Jesus, and there is something about this, this idea of desperation that brings us to our knees where we can touch him. And nothing will ever be the same. Nothing. And from now on, every time you see blue, wherever it is, whether it's the sky, water, as I said, a shirt, wherever you see blue, remember, it's time for me to touch Jesus.